Welcome to the Right Science Daily Revision Boost. So one of the things that I've been asked to run through with you before your exams is how you can actually tackle some of these trickier application questions. Now, what I've got here is an example of one of these application questions. So Hashimoto's disease can be detected by a rise in thyroid stimulating hormone TSH and low blood levels of the thyroid hormone thyroxine. Diseases cause symptoms, look at the list of symptoms, and then you're given six there. Choose two symptoms someone with Hashimoto's disease would have. Now, if this had been a question on your summer exam paper, I guarantee that by that night, then on social media, there would have been a whole slew of students going up and posting about how rubbish their biology teacher was, never having told them about Hashimoto's disease. And the reality is we don't have to. Because what we've got here is a question that is talking about thyroxine. So one of the things that the exam paper will do is post up questions in unfamiliar contexts. So don't be one of the muppets that goes on and slates your teacher because they didn't teach you about fireflies or a particular disease. Because the reality is the questions are quite obviously about something you have been taught about. So in this case, what we can see here is we get a rise in thyroid stimulating hormone and low levels of our thyroxine. So think about what we know about thyroxine first of all. We know that thyroxine controls the energy available to cells so that when we increase the amount of thyroxine in the blood, then the metabolic rate also increases. So that means cells can transfer more energy to carry out particular functions. So if we've got a lower level of thyroxine, as it tells us in the question here, that means we're gonna have a much lower metabolic rate. So looking at the six things there, think logically, if we've got less energy available to our cells, what we're going to find is we're not going to be generating much in terms of heat, so we're gonna feel colder, and your heart rate is going to be slowed because heart rate is obviously something that needs energy here. So you can just work this out just by recalling your knowledge on thyroxine. In the second part of the question, then we need to look at the diagram they've given us. It shows the mechanism for controlling thyroxine production. So straight off, we can tell that this is a question about controlling thyroxine production, which is something we know about. The thyroid gland stores large amounts of thyroid hormone, Hashimoto's disease destroys thyroid tissue and reduces the store of thyroid hormone. So we need to explain why and suggest how it can be treated. So first of all, go back to what you know. We're talking about controlling thyroxine production. We know this is all to do with a negative feedback system. So when we need to explain, then we go back to explaining how negative feedback works here. So we know that as a result of this, the pituitary gland responds to different levels of thyroxine. So that when we've got high levels of thyroxine, then TSH production is inhibited. Whereas if we've got a low store of thyroxine as the result of this Hashimoto's disease, then the pituitary gland is going to keep making TSH. So what we've done there, just by going back to our knowledge of what negative feedback systems are, and giving an explanation of how it works, linking it into the disease that they've told us about the problem, then we've got three of the four marks here. The last one is for suggesting how the condition can be treated. So if our problem is that we've got a reduced store of the thyroid hormone thyroxine, then the treatment is going to be to give the people thyroxine. So do look at the information in the question and don't forget to look back to the very start of the question, if this is a part B, for example, because they do like to give you things that you can work with. And then just go back to the basics. What do I know about this section? And start from there. On part C, we've got a section from a graph here. So it shows how the normal acceptable levels of TSH in the blood are affected by age. So first thing we do whenever we've got a graph is always look at your two axes. So on our X axis, we've got the age group in years and the Y axis, the TSH levels. Now we also have a key at the side here, which gives us the upper limit and the lower limit. So make sure that you do look to see what the graph is telling you before jumping straight into an answer. 
Now, this one, we've got to describe two trends shown in the graph, and we get one mark for each. So, because on this graph we've quite clearly got two key lines, a lower limit and an upper limit, then the two trends are talking about one for the lower limit and one for the upper limit. So hopefully we can see that for our lower limit, it actually remains pretty constant throughout the ages. So your first mark there would just be saying that the lower limit remains fairly constant with age. The second one, talking about the upper limit, we can see that generally it's an increasing trend. So your second mark there would just be for talking about the fact that the upper limit increases with age. So the last part of this question is here. Hashimoto's disease is usually detected by high TSH levels in the blood. Explain why it's important for doctors to use the graph when diagnosing Hashimoto's disease. So again in the question they're giving us this big hint here by saying that it's usually detected by high TSH levels in the blood. The other thing, if it's one of these little part twos as a Roman numeral, then usually is linked to whatever is in part one. So in part one, we had the graph. We're talking about Hashimoto's disease usually being detected by high TSH levels in the blood. And we need to explain why we use the graph. So think back, what did that graph show us? It told us that the upper limit increased with age. So if we're considering if someone has Hashimoto's disease, the age is important because we can't just say that if someone has level X of TSH, then they have Hashimoto's disease because if they're just an older person, that's just normal for them. So we get our two marks on this one, one for saying that the upper limit increases with age and the second one for saying that so must consider the age of the patient when deciding if their levels are normal. So here's some of the past exam questions and the delightful Twitter comments posted by other Year 11s in the past for your own entertainment. So on the left, we've got a question from an additional science paper of the past that's talking about fireflies. And of course, it goes into lots of detail about enzymes in that second little block of text there and an entire graph about temperature and its effect on enzymes. So obviously, this question is purely about enzymes. So we've not learned about fireflies, no, because that's irrelevant, it's the context. What we need to talk about is enzymes and temperature. In this question here, what we were given was a bit of information about a boat race and a part finished graph. So what we've got here is obviously just someone asking which boat would win the race. Hopefully, common sense here, extrapolate a line. Don't just sit there and say, how was I meant to know what boat won the race when they hadn't even finished? Because we can draw a line with a ruler, folks, is the answer there. Another example from the past is talking about the Ebola virus here. So obviously on part of the course, we've learned about a few key diseases to illustrate key points. But it doesn't really matter what we've got here, because if we look, we have to calculate the number of deaths. It's quite simple. We can work that one out by using the fatality rate and, of course, the equation they gave us in the question. And then we can just explain why that headline is not a good summary of the data. Someone who's never set foot in a science room could actually do that. If we're literally sitting there saying that headline says Ebola kills three out of every four infected people, look at the information in the question, talk about why that's not a great summary. Do remember that whatever context they set these questions in, even when it's in the context of things you've never heard of before, it doesn't matter because the context is just there to set it in a different scene. The actual main part of the question you have learnt about. So look for what is the question actually asking so you don't think that you need to know a whole bunch of random facts from Google in order to answer this paper. You just needed to have paid attention in science for the past few years. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can now understand how to unpick these application questions a little bit better. So do remember the key facts here. Number one, read the whole question. So don't just skip over the bit at the beginning and go to the answer line because OCR are very good at actually giving you an awful lot of hints, guidance, and sometimes just blatantly the answer in that part of the question. So when you read it, look for those pointers. 
It might be an unfamiliar context, something you've never heard of before, but that doesn't matter because it will be asking you about something from your actual course. So find out what it is and then make those connections in your brain to then be able to answer the questions. Don't forget that on Monday night between 6.30 and 8, we've got our live seminar on B1, B2 and B3. So hopefully I will see you then when we're going to run through the main topics.